Now in John chapter 10, we read in verse 1, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Can you imagine that? Jesus was fairly narrow-minded. This is the same Jesus that said a few chapters later, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. And then in verse 2, But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep by name, and leadeth them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep followeth him, for they know his voice. And a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. Now, wait a minute. Jesus had just declared that if you tried to go in any other way, then the door into the sheepfold, you're a thief and a robber. And then he said, He's the door. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Shall we pray? Our wonderful and precious, gracious Heavenly Father, we acknowledge to you today that we're not particularly special in any way or regard. Lord, what is here today is an assemblage of sinners. And yet, for the most of us, we can gladly declare, not boastfully, but rejoicing, we can say, sinners saved by grace. It could very well be, and in all probability it is, that there are some that have never experienced the glorious, wonderful grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pray that before this day is concluded that they might come to the recognition of that great need in their life and heart and that their entire destiny will be determined by what they do with the one who is the door. Our Father, we would like to examine a little bit about abundant living today. We need your help, your insight, your revelation. Would you grant it, I pray, For Jesus' sake, in His name, Amen. Our text is the last half of verse 10. Jesus said, I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. The first thing to observe is life itself. Jesus Christ has come that you might have life. All right, now this life is defined in verse 28. Look down in the verse. It says, And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. In the estimation of Jesus Christ, according to the dictates of God's Word, you don't really have life unless you have eternal life. Unless you have a plan, a program installed in your heart and mind which is a veritable guarantee that you are going to live and live and live and live. That's eternal life. Now, Jesus said, I'm come that you might have life. But the greater question that we'd like to entertain this morning is, what about abundant life? Two different issues. If you're saved today, if you've trusted the Savior... If you've been born again, you have life. You say, I don't always feel like it. That's all right. You got it anyway. I've been fighting off a sinus infection this week. I didn't feel like I had life. I felt like I had death. But I didn't quit breathing. Still had life. You see what I'm saying? I, what I'm trying to tell you is your feelings don't have anything to do with it. It's the covenant contract of God that dictates the whole purpose of the thing. Now, you have life, but what about abundant life? 
What I'm talking about is, are you enjoying it? Are you looking forward to tomorrow? Are you expressing joy? Is there peace and comfort in your life? Quite frankly, as you stroll the byways and the shores of America today, it's quite difficult, in my estimation, to find people with any kind of facial expression that suggests they are experiencing abundant life. I mean, some of you are right here right now going... You look, bless your heart, like you've been weaned on a dill pickle. Raised on persimmon. I mean, <clears throat> where's the abundance in the life? What is abundant living? Well, let's first examine what it is not. Go to Luke chapter 12, if you would, with me. Just one book back from where you are. Luke chapter 12. Luke 12 and <clears throat> verse 15. We're about to discover what abundant living is not. Luke 12, 15, And he said unto them, Take heed, and he be beware of covetousness. For man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. So abundant living doesn't have anything to do with an accumulation of junk. Doesn't have anything to do with he who dies with the most toys wins. Because the truth of the matter is, you've never seen a U-Haul truck in a funeral procession. Alright? And then, to sink this deep into the minds of his listeners, Jesus went on to tell a brief parable. Let's see what it was. Verse 16, he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. He's already rich. And now he gets a bumper crop. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And he said, This will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. And there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, He's talking to himself now, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall these things be which thou hast provided? So, <clears throat> Jesus illustrated the idea that abundant living isn't the accumulation of stuff. Well, then what is abundant living? As I research the word abundant, abundance, abundantly in the Bible, I discovered that they are frequently associated, we're not going to take time to look up all the verses, but they're frequently associated with the words grace, joy, revelations, and love. Well, now those are things that really, in reality, everyone needs and desires. What's the principle here? There's an underlying principle that brings forth and establishes abundant living. Let's go to uh, John 12. John chapter 12 and verse 24. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. The principle is, when you put a seed into the ground, a seed of anything, the seed itself must die. And in the process of the seed's death, it grows into a plant, a tree, whatever it may be, and eventually produces fruit. Now, that principle is established because Jesus Christ Himself conformed to it. He came as a seed... The Word of God, He's called in John chapter 1 and verse 14 and 1, 1, and being born again, not a corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And He died, and in His death He brought forth much fruit. And that's why there would have been veritable millions of people over the centuries that have confessed Jesus Christ and are now part of the kingdom of God and are declared to be His children and His princes. For all of eternity, that's much fruit. 
Now, <clears throat> so in some strange way, we're told to follow his example. If Jesus had to die to bring forth fruit in abundance, I guess in some strange way we've got to do the same thing. Now, does that mean that we don't bring forth fruit until they haul us off to the graveyard? The only fruit I can see in the graveyard is worms. That's not what he's talking about. Quite to the contrary. There is desired fruit that is associated and connected to abundant living in your Bible. Go with me to Galatians 5. You know, the thing that I hate to see almost as much as an individual who's lost and on their way to hell and won't repent and trust Christ, I suppose that's the most grievous thing in life to me. But the second most grievous thing is a miserable Christian. If you trusted Christ, oh yeah, I'm saved, glory to God. We well, sure act happy about it. Well, you know, I got a lot of problems. Well, then you need to discover abundant living. Now, in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit. All right, now wait a minute. And this message is primarily dedicated. I'm kind of giving you some theological principles here in the introduction, but we're going to get super practical momentarily. But I want you to get the principle. I'm dedicating this message primarily to people who we've got a large number of folk that have recently been saved. What I want you to do is get off on the right foot. I'm going to try to give you some things today that will help you establish abundant living in your life. I don't want you to be unhappy and neither does God. I want you to experience all the abundance that God has for you. Now, a lot of the modern day preaching, that all translates into financial prosperity. Well, that's a little unbiblical, but let's see what the fruit of the Spirit is. You see, when you trusted the Savior and God saved, the Spirit of God literally moved into you and took up residence in you. He's living there. Now... <clears throat> If you'll do what God wants you to do, it will turn into a great abundance of what? Let's start. Verse 22 of Galatians chapter 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith. Meekness, temperance, against such, there is no law. Those are all things that will help you. They'll encourage you. They'll be a great source of blessing to you. Now, what do you need to do? Here comes the practical part of it. You say, all right, I'm, I'm, I'm a brand new believer. Perhaps you're not, but you've just kind of been rocking along High-centered, all four wheels spinning in the sand for a long time in your Christian life. What do you need to do to get tapped into abundant living? I am come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. I mean, this whole business is just kind of dragging through life. It's pointless, is it not? And what have we discovered? Things... Do not provide abundant living. Now, let me show you a statistic to prove that. When in the history of America, when in the history of the world, have teenagers had more stuff than they have today? Did they have more stuff in the 50s? Did they have more stuff in the 40s or the 20s? Did they have more stuff in the 70s? When have they had more stuff than they do today? I know I said that to say this. The number one killer 
among teenagers in America is suicide. I guess God's right. Abundant living does not come from the accumulation of stuff. It must be something else. I wonder what it is. God says, here's what I'll make available to you. Love, joy, peace, gentleness, long-suffering, meekness, faith. Then he phrases it really interestingly. He says, against such there is no law. In other words, there's nothing that can countermand that. There's nothing that can overrule that. There's nothing that can steal that or take that away. God's people need to tap into abundant living. Now, how do you do it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let's go to Luke chapter 9. <clears throat> In Luke chapter 9 and verse 23, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever shall lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? The first thing that you need to do, and I've got six of them on my list. I could come up with many more, but six is about all that this message has time for. I've got more sermon, I just don't have more time, see? So, uh, is this. Practice a little self-denial. Practice a little self-denial. Which simply means disagree with the world when they say it's all about you. They even have a bumper sticker out now that says, it's all about me. No, it isn't. But if you pursue that mentality, if you continue to harbor and embrace that thinking, you are destined to be miserable. You will not find love and joy and peace and gentleness and meekness and faith and long-suffering. Jesus had to deny Himself a lot more than He'll ever ask you and I to deny ourselves. When he went to Calvary. Our young people are going, as we previously demonstrated, on a missions trip to Mexico. You say, what's that all about? We're working with a missions organization down there that <clears throat> has been doing this for years. And uh, they know what they're doing and they accommodate all the necessities. But one of the objectives is to help our young people have an opportunity to kind of get out of their little box and see the world through a different perspective and help somebody else. It's not... You know, it's not, hey, we're going to Mexico, and man, we're going to have a blast on the beach. It's not that. It's not, oh, yeah, boy, this is going to be a great party. No, it's not that. In 1967, I started taking young people to Mexico on missions trips from Wichita, Kansas. I and a fellow that you may know, and if you don't, you'll meet him in our missions conference in May, Roscoe Brewer, who was youth pastor at a church in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was youth pastor at a church in Wichita, Kansas. We teamed up, and between the two of us, we took over 100 teenagers to Mexico every year and worked with a, with a missionary, Lonnie Smith, down there in Monterey, Mexico. And, and we distributed Spanish New Testaments door-to-door. -door. We helped build buildings. We helped build a youth camp. We held evangelistic crusades every single night and two, three times on Sunday. And we just, we just worked ourselves and the kids right down to the bare nubbins. I mean, we did. We built a building one year, I'll never forget it. We built it the Mexican way. 
because that's what we had to work with. We didn't have all the modern advantages of construction. It was a concrete building and with a concrete floor. We mixed all the concrete for the floor by hand with shovel and hoe and wheelbarrow. We wheeled it in. And then we got some concrete block in there and we mixed all the mortar by hand. And we laid up the block and we built some wood trusses and we put the wood trusses on the building, put some tin on it, you know. And that's what we did. And then every day the neighbors would come around in this particular barrio where we were working and they'd come and they'd look. And those kids, bless their hearts, I'm here to tell you, man, I mean, they grabbed the, uh, they grabbed the bull by the horns and they did a job. I remember one day I, uh, I told one boy, I said, you need to stop, go sit in the shade, drink some water and take a couple salt pills. We had lots of water, lots, lots, it was hot, 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 hot. Sunny, hot, you know, sweat just dripping off. I said, go sit down for a while. Oh, he said, we got to get down. I said, no, you can go sit down for a while. He said, and he says, you know, he got to look at his hands. He says, I got blisters on top of my blisters. <laughs> I looked at his hands. He did. Hard to get blisters on top of your blisters with your iPod. That young man today is a missionary in Peru. He got out of his box. His life was filled with Abundant living. And not just his, but dozens of others. He said, man. We came home. We had testimonies this Sunday night after we got home from the kids, just like we will have here. Of what they saw, they experienced, they learned. And they stood in the pulpit and they shed tears and they said, I learned it's not all about me. Amen. Learn a little self-denial. Say no to the old flesh just once in a while. It won't kill you. It'll help you. Secondly, go to Mark 12. In Mark 12, in verse 41, And Jesus sat over against the treasury and beheld how the people cast money into the treasury, and many that were rich cast in much. And there were a certain poor widow, and she threw in two mites, which made a farthing. And he called unto him his disciples, and saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, that this poor widow hath cast more in than all they which hath cast into the treasury. For they, all they did cast in of their abundance, but she of her want did cast in all that she had, even all her living. Now notice they cast into their abundance. Not abundant living, abundant money. They put a little in. This poor woman put everything that she had in. And Jesus is actually sitting and observing and watching what people are putting into the offering plate. That's why in many black churches across the country, particularly down south to this day, it's a custom when they take the offering, they don't pass the plate through the rows. They have the plates right here in front of the preacher. And he stands here and all the people get up and they walk by the offering plate and they deposit their offering. And he stands there and watches. And he goes, mm hmm. Mm. I say all that to say this. Attempt to be a giver. Attempt to be a giver. You say, I want abundant living, all right? Understand that God's logic is just about 180 degrees from ours most of the time. The prophet Isaiah said, His thoughts are not our thoughts, His ways are not our ways. You figure out a thing one way and you can almost bank on the fact that God's got it figured out the opposite direction. Look with me over in Luke chapter 6, if you would. <clears throat> Learn how to be a giver. Selfishness never brings abundant living. Never, never, never. I don't know that Bill Gates has ever professed Christianity in any way, shape, or form. But he's got enough brains to at least understand that selfishness does not bring abundant living. And that's why he's continually giving millions away. Alright, in Luke chapter 6 and verse 38, it says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down and shaken together and running over, shall men give unto your bosom, for with the same measure that you met with all, shall it be measured to you again. Notice, give and it shall be given unto you. What is it? I'll tell you what it is. It is whatever you gave. 
giving it some, what is it? It is what you gave. You, you say, well, I'm just, man, we're always behind the eight ball financially. We never can quite make uh, ends meet. We're always just, you know, just always on the short end of things. You know what my suggestion is to you? It's not going to make any sense to you at all. It is not going to, it is not going to uh, fit in human logic. It is going to be repudiated and disputed over and over again. But I know what God says. Give. Oh, that can't work. I already can't meet all my obligations. I can't afford to give. I can't afford to tithe, preacher. Take it up with God. He said, give and it shall be given unto you. I have found the best way in the world in my life to get money is give it. I could stand here for the next three days, 24 hours a day, nonstop, and give you personal testimonies of that. I found the best way to get it is to give it. But maybe it's not money isn't the issue. Let's talk about something else. I'm just feeling so rejected. I'm feeling so forlorn, so... Okay. You need some love and compassion? Give it. Give and it shall be given unto you. I'm continually amazed. I said to a lady one time that I was visiting in the hospital. She said to me, she said, uh, this was in another church, so I'm not tattling on anybody here. She said, Pastor, Except for you, no one from our church has visited me in the hospital. I said, really? I said, ma'am, can I ask you a question? She said, yes. I said, how many other folks in our church, when they've been in the hospital, have you visited? Oh, well, she said, I guess I haven't. Give and it shall be given unto you. I need, I need, I want, I want. Give it away, give it away, give it away, give it away. Learn to be a giver. Whatever you give, you sow generosity, you receive it. People want to be on the receiving end of prayer. But they don't want to be on the giving end of prayer nearly as much. Now, you're a new believer. Let me help you. As practically as I know how. Let me help you. We have one service a week around here, which is dedicated exclusively to not about you. I mean, every other service, you come to church, you say, well, I'm going to get a blessing. Okay, fine. We want you to get one. I mean, you come to Sunday school, you learn something. You receive. Amen? You come to Sunday morning, uh, hopefully you receive something. You come Sunday night, um, uh, Dr. Marshall Foster is going to give you something tonight, some excellent information that will, you know, it will tantalize your thinking. It will help your... A lot of things for you. That's all grand. Uh, You know, but we have one service during the week that's not about us. It just isn't about us. It's prayer meeting. It's the least attended service. You know why? Because the whole emphasis is, hey, we're not here to talk about us. We're here to see what we can do for others. We're praying for others. We do it on Saturday night at 6 o'clock. We come at 6. We're out the door by 7 we spend about 30 minutes just allowing people to um, surrender prayer requests. And 98% of the prayer requests are about others. I have an unsaved friend, an unsaved neighbor, an unsaved someone who's sick or suffering. Can we pray? Can we pray? Can we pray? Many people sit there and they write the names down. They'll faithfully write them down. We break up into little groups and we go around and we pray. Now, don't be upset with me. But you'd be amazed how many people call the church office. And say, I know you'll be praying Saturday night. Could you put my name on the list? But they're never there. Give and it shall be given unto you. Learn to be a giver. Well, that's terrifying. I mean, how do you do it now? Oh, we break off in groups of twos and threes and just pray. Well, I'd be embarrassed. Well, then you just say to your partners, look, I'm a greenhorn at this. I'm new. Can I just be a listener? And they'll say, absolutely. That's fine. And you listen until all of a sudden the Spirit of God gets a hold of you and says, you've got to open your mouth. I was praying with a man right here in this church one time. 
And he said, I've never done this before. I said, you don't have to. You can if you want to. I said, I'll pray. The guy with us, he'll pray. And if you want to pray, you pray. If you don't, that's fine. And so I prayed. The other guy prayed. And then there was a long pause. And I was just getting ready to say, uh, I was just getting ready to say, all right, let's, let's call it quits. And I'm glad you came. And all of a sudden, I know the Lord just got a hold of the guy. And he said, Lord, I don't know much about this, but I'm, I'm, just, I'm just glad to be saved. Amen. And he looked at me kind of embarrassed. I put my arm on his shoulder. I said, that was perfect. That was perfect. It couldn't be any better. What a great start. Amen? What a great start. He said, well, I can't come every Saturday night. Come every other Saturday night. Well, I just have come once a month. Could you go to a prayer meeting once a month? I read a great article this week. A guy was suggesting this. In fact, he was developing a whole program in his church based on this idea. He had done a covert survey among his church members. They didn't know what he was up to. And he accumulated the documented statistic based on the response of his church members as to how many hours a week they listen to the television and or the radio. And then the program was, would you be willing to tithe, give 10% of what you give to the television and the radio to God? Does that sound outrageous? You see, learn to be a giver in your prayers, in your finances, in your life, in your generosity, in your concern for others. That will help you enter into abundant living. Thirdly, go to 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Well, preacher, I don't have to come to prayer meeting to pray. No, that's true. But how would you know all the needs of other folks if you didn't? Jesus said, where two or three are gathered together in my name's sake, there will I be also. I just find the whole thing absolutely a positive experience for the believer. Because when you come to prayer meeting, you walk in the door and you sit down, and immediately you are faced with a whole concept, it's not about me. It just isn't. All right, in 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse 14, but continue down the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them, and that from a child thou hast known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make thee wise unto salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is given by inspiration to God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. And all of that to say this, Determine to evaluate your lifestyle, your decisions, and your choices, and your view of the world through the Bible. Allow the Bible to become your spectacles. Allow the Bible to become your prism. Allow the Bible to interpret for you the facts of life. You say, I have to make a decision about. Allow the Bible to help you. I can't think of an important decision in life that you cannot find information about it that will help you in the Word of God. Now, you've got to be around it. You've got to be familiar with it. You've got to get acquainted with it. You've got to learn about it. Amen? Allow the Bible to help you. So much more we could say about that. But there's something else that I must hasten on to. Go to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. I want you to have abundant living. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, For we dare not make ourselves of the number, or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves, but they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Now, the next thing you need to remember if you're going to move into the abundant living syndrome is avoid the comparison game. Notice what the book says. It says, in comparing themselves among themselves, they are not wise. On one hand, you get people that say, well, those people over there, they seem like such spiritual giants. I will never, never reach that level. It's discouraging to me. 
And I guess I'm just not going to even try. I'll quit. Comparing themselves among themselves, they were not wise. On the flip side, you have people that say, well, boy, I know I'm a lot better than that. That dirt bag over there. Comparing themselves among themselves, they were not wise. Run your own race. You have a race. You have a lane. Stay in it. Forget about everybody else in that regard. If you can be a help and a blessing to other people, you'll be a help and a blessing. But you're not here to compare yourselves. Well, I'll just... I have people say to me, and I've had over the years, well, I'll never know as much Bible as you do, preacher, but, well, bless your little pointed head. I don't expect you to. I just expect you to run your race and do the best you can do. Amen? Comparing themselves among themselves, they were not wise. If there's anything I pray that Faith Baptist Church will never, ever, ever be, is one of those comparing churches. You know, well, boy. You know, you've been in churches where folks come in and the first thing they do is they're kind of looking around. And saying, Did you see how they were dressed? <laughs> oh. No, really doesn't matter. Avoid the comparison game. Just avoid it like the plague. But here's another one. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. I guess there was a day when this would even, just not even be, need to be mentioned, but you can't take anything for granted anymore. In Hebrews 10.25 it says, Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another... And so much the more as you see the day approaching. You know what that's talking about? Go to church. Go to church! Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together. Someone said, well, I can be a Christian without joining or attending a church. Is it possible? Yeah. Yeah, it's possible, but it's kind of like this. It's kind of like a student who will not go to school. It's a soldier who will not join the army. It's a citizen who does not pay taxes or vote. It's a salesman with no customers. It's an explorer with no base camp. It's a seaman in a ship without a crew. It's a businessman marooned on a deserted island. It's an author without readers. It's a football player without a team. It's a politician who is a hermit. It's a scientist who does not share his findings. It's a bee without a hive. And a Christian without a church is like those things. I didn't come up with the idea of church. God did. I didn't invent the word church, nor did any other Baptist, Methodist, Episcopalian preacher. God did. God's the one that endorsed it, came up with it. Go to church. Now, some people say, yeah, but I don't like your style. Then bless your heart. Find one where you do. I have said many times, Faith Baptist Church isn't for everybody. Churches assume personalities. Not only doctrine, but personalities. And I realize that we have kind of a, because I pastor the church, a coarse personality. I know that. A lady in our church asked me a Bible question the other day. She said, where can I get my hands on a book that will help me understand that? I said, the best book I can recommend on that subject is Dr. Ruckman's book. But then I was, I was fearful. So I said to her, I said, now, keep in mind, keep in mind, if you read his book, you're going to have to deal with his sarcasm. She looked at me. She said, I deal with yours. <laughs> Fair enough. Churches have personalities. Well, I don't like this church. I don't like that church. Well, find one. Make sure it preaches the book. Make sure it gets you in the Bible. Make sure it instills in your heart a love, a reverence, a regard, and respect for the Holy Word of God. It may have an entirely different personality. I watch Dr. Kennedy on the television periodically. He's a Presbyterian. 
You talk about a different church personality. You know, he stands there in his robes, and the choir have their robes, and the great big pipe organ. And You say, you like all that stuff? Not particularly, but it doesn't offend me. Not particularly, it doesn't offend me. It's a different personality. The first church I went to work for after I got out of Bible college, the First Bible Baptist Church of Wichita, Kansas, it was an independent Baptist church just like this. But it was far more formal. The same deal. The preacher didn't wear a robe, but the choir did. And uh, we had a very formal Sunday morning service. And uh, we were all in the back room, in the choir room, you know, there. And uh, uh, the pastor, myself, the associate pastor in the choir. And at the appropriate moment and in the precise given signal by the organist, the choir would begin to march in. And they would march in and they would fill the choir loft in their nice shiny choir robes and and then we would follow, and, and I and the pastor would sit over here on one side of the platform, and the associate pastor, who was also the music director, would sit on the other side. And he would stand, and he would lead in the formal doxology, you know, and all the church would stand and sing that great anthem of the faith, you know. And I, you say, you got a problem with that? No, I, not, not at all. And then it was my responsibility to step up to the pulpit and lead in a, in a fairly formal pastoral prayer. And the pastor would always have a list of things there that I was supposed to remember in that prayer, you know. And uh, <clears throat> we would go through all that. You say that bothered you? No, it didn't bother me. You object to it? No, 